started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Wes Frazier, who is the PI of Large and Loan Program 1. Um, so this is the officially um, the last observing run for um, LP1 under the current uh, proposal. Uh, so Wes currently is a Queen's University Research Fellow at, um, at the Queen's University of Belfast. Um, he is also the LSST UK Source of Science Collaboration Point of Contact. Um, before that, Wes was a Plaskett Fellow um, in Canada, and uh, before that, has been a postdoc, a postdoc at a Caltech, where I met Wes um, in Mike Brown's group. So Wes is PI of Colossus, which is the LP Colors of the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, and today is going to be talking a little bit about the results um, from that project. Thanks, Wes. Thank yeah, she's, she still can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is uh, uh, the last, the original program was supposed to be eight semesters, but they the tech said they can't give you uh, eight semesters because they're not available uh, to, be, to be applied for. So this is semester six and possibly the last, and eight, probably the last because of uh, the lack of uh, history of giving extensions that we've asked for. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, maybe it's a good thing. I'm certainly getting uh, tired with these 24 hour trips over for, for uh, 10 nights in a row. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Colossus, um, uh, Colors of the Outer Solar System Origins Survey, a bit of a mouthful, um, but it was the obvious extension um, to the Outer, Outer Solar System Origins Survey, which is a survey that's happening on uh, the CFHT telescopes, is basically just finishing up now. And the idea is it was observing um, eight, about 22 square degree patches to track and, and monitor and discover uh, Kuiper Belt objects in a way that should have been done sort of 20 years ago with exquisite uh, astrometry and so on and so forth. But it's taken multiple iterations of these sorts of things to finally uh, uh, figure out how to do the job correctly. Um, and so we decided with Meg and, and so on, here's the, uh, sorry, each slide transition takes a long time with this current setup. So uh, we'll, we'll see if this actually works. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be showing you the team right now. Um, maybe that one? Yeah, see this is the problem with Zoom, is using Zoom because my computer is basically frozen. Uh, so let's try that. No, escape doesn't work. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can move the mouse, but I can't. See. Oh, okay. Maybe that will work. We'll try that one. Okay. All right. So here's a team of people. Um, in the the pictures I've put up, the you know, of, of the, the four of us that are the keys that have made this happen. There, you know, of course, there's a lot more people to the project. Um, I've starred Michael Marsit here because he's recently taken on the the, the J band uh, reductions for the program, which um, well, it's near infrared on on those crazy Hawaii detectors that Kennedy has. Um, <laughs> but regardless, um, the, so this is the, 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 the main operators, uh, the proposers, or at least the original science design. Meg has been very critical in, in getting all of the necessary software uh, that, that we've needed to get the, make the program work uh, up and running. And so these are the four people I really want to like, show Michelle, Meg, and, and Rosemary, because you know, without them, I would not have been able to do this. But then, of course, there's also the, the OSIS team, which is discovering all of the targets that we're then pointing our telescope at. And this is a key um, thing because they've got well understood discovery biases. And so we can then take from that a sample that is intelligent, basically everything brighter than uh, an R, little r of 23.6 that makes up our sample. And then from that, we can go forward and do some actual population statistics uh, with, with our, our um, uh, surfaces uh, sampling. Um, which is the first time that we've been able to do this sort of thing. Um, so this is where so the, sort of the mindset that Colossus, yes, there have been lots of color surveys in the past, but Colossus is the first one that actually uh, started with the beginning, the idea of actually doing proper population counts with known biases. And so that's, I think, the strength of the program. Um, now for a little context, hopefully this movie will play. Yeah, okay. So this is the uh, known outer solar system. Each one of these points is a... Kuiper Belt object or a Jupiter family comet uh, in some cases. Uh, let's try to get the mouse out of the way here. Um, the gas giant planets are these circles that you see zipping around here. The dwarf planets, or at least the largest 10 known Kuiper Belt objects, are, are circled here. So that one, that one going that way is, I think, four or 10. Three, right? One of your favorites. Uh, Jupiter, uh, the uh, uh, Jupiter um, Trojans are in blue there. I've only shown one in 10 there because there's just so many of them known. But there's uh, in, in terms of the Kuiper Belt, anyways, there's about 2,300 points in this plot. Um, 1,800 of those are actual Kuiper Belt objects. 
And now if we colorize this, yeah, good, good timing. Um, uh, this is the, the trying to show the dynamical structure in the belt. And so uh, I'll walk you through a few of the points here. Um, the red ones are uh, cold classicals, which will be a, a point of discussion later here. And they're in a little thin ring. To call this a, a belt, I think, is actually unfair. It's just a tiny little annulus, the thinnest donut you've ever seen. Um, and when, you, when this gets to an edge on, you can really see that. The purple ones are resonators or mean motion resonant uh, objects. And so you can see when you get to a, 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 a sort of a structure like this, there's a band here, a band there, and Neptune there sitting in between the two. And these are basically the protected because they're in mean motion resonances. I mean, they go around the sun every, most of them are Plutinos, they go around the sun uh, two times for every Neptune is three, but they always come to perihelion at 90 or so degrees away from uh, Neptune and they remain that way. Um, the scattered disk are uh, completely dynamically independent populations shown in yellow here um, that eventually feed into the centaurs and the Jupiter family comets, which are uh, yellow and white in here as well. And so we believe that the evolution is to go from this region outwards into the scattering disk where you start to see some of the gas giant interactions and then eventually fall in. Um, thanks for getting lights, I appreciate that. Um, so this is a fun animation. I, I, I regret not making this a decade ago because it has just informed me a lot of just how dynamic the other solar system actually is. Um, but the specific way to look at this is this plot right here, um, which really just emphasizes how dynamically different some of these populations are. Um, so this is uh, orbital eccentricity, um, heliocentric ecliptic inclination, and semi-major axis, or just average orbital distance. Um, for most of those points. Um, the black ones here are ones that have colors measured for them in, in a way that I actually trust, not that that matters to you guys, but um, the scattered disk is this band right here. The mean motion resonances are in these fingers right here and the cold classicals sit in that tiny little box down there, which would be in this little clump right there. And so these are the three sorts of populations that one needs to think about uh, in, in terms of the Kuiper belt. Um, and the real question has been for a number of years now, where that came from. Where did, where did all this structure come from? And that's what Colossus is trying to help inform us of because we've realized that there's actually color correlations in all of these things. You only find certain types of surface in certain places. Um, and so the idea is to not just study this dynamically, but to actually use the where, map where these surfaces actually are, figure out where they came from and uh, inform the dynamics of how they got from the original primordial disk to what we see here. And so that's the, the overarching story um, or at least that's what I spun when I wrote the proposal. I wasn't sure if it was going to work, uh, but you know, observations are fun, so you gotta try. And fantastically, it actually is kind of working, which I'm, I'm maybe a bit uh, surprised about. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, a little bit of history on dynamics here. Um, this is the original idea, smooth migration of, of uh, Neptune was the original idea proposed by Renu Malhotra back in 1993 uh, to populate the resonant populations of the Kuiper Belt. You know, how do we get all these Plutinos, uh, like Pluto, for instance, in there? And this is basically just a gift pr provided by Rodney Gomez on how this happens. And so uh, these are dwarf planets. These are all test particles. And this V here represents the location of an eccentric Neptune. Uh, angular momentum uh, uh, gets transferred from the disk to Neptune uh, when Neptune gravitationally interacts. And so Neptune gets thrust outwards. And then uh, all those little green points are the victims um, that not only do they give their, their angular momentum, they give their orbital lives to Neptune, they get kicked out of the solar system or eaten by the sun, and you're left with these very, very few points here. And so Neptune in this case migrated at about 10 AU, which is seemingly the right-ish distance um, to, to populate the mean motion resonances. And you can see sort of 1% of the points are left over in these two fingers here in this particular version of the simulation. And so this was basically the, the, Kuiper, the existence of these heavily populated mean motion resonances in the Kuiper Belt was the first really, really strong evidence to say that, in fact, the gas giant planets did not form where they are. <coughs> the only way you can populate these things is if you move Neptune through that disk, right? Because it takes energy to get into a mean motion resonance. Once you're there, you're stuck, but there's a potential that you have to overcome. And this is basically what, uh, what's happened here. Um, there's a number of problems with this idea, including Neptune's rate of motion, the overall orbital distribution you get, the fact that it destroys the cold distribution, and so on and so forth. But, you know, to zeroth or maybe even first order, something like this happened. 
Um, now let me show you another uh, more extreme and uh, equally wrong uh, version. This is called the Nice model, and a, a number of you have seen this animation from me before, again, also from Rodney Gomez. Um, so this is now a top-down view of the early solar system with the gas giant planets and this, this disk of sort of test particles. Um, note the distance here, this is 18 AU for the outermost uh, planet, which in fact, this is Uranus and Neptune in this particular case. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's pretty stable. There's not much angular momentum being transferred in because the gas giant planets are in this sort of locked, it's almost locked configuration, but you can see a little bit of action happening, a few objects being sent in, a few objects being sent out, and a little bit of dancing until <laughs> and it all blows up. Um, and now look, Neptune is in the right place. It has swapped outwards. Basically what's happened here is a dynamical um, instability has been crossed. Um, Uranus, or actually I think in this case it was Saturn moved inwards a little bit and crossed the uh, three to two mean motion resonance with Jupiter, which that's a lot of angular momentum exchange. And so the whole solar system blows up, like literally blows up. Um, now, the, the only reason, if, if this model is true, which, you know, to, again, to first order, it seems like it actually is, um, which I'll show you in a sec, but the only reason why we're still here is because the Kuiper belt was once massive, or at least the primordial disk was once massive. Because when this explosion happens, those gas giant planets, everything but Jupiter is put on a very eccentric orbit. And I mean, by very, it's only, you know, 10% eccentricity, but that's really enough when you're talking about the majority of the angular momentum of the solar system. Um, and so it's only the interaction with that massive disk that strips out enough of that angular momentum and puts the planets back on circular orbits. And I have to tune this very hard to get um, the, the right locations for all of the planets at the end. Or alternatively, you should look at the history of the solar system as a very stochastic thing, and we are very lucky people. Uh, or so something the inner, like that. The inner rocky planets, they were affected by this. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, what happened. So the, the, the key there is you have to, um, the reason why we know that something like this occurs is if Neptune moves out as far as we think it did and does it slowly, then there are other resonances from Ju you know, Jupiter moves in because Neptune moves out, there's just an angular momentum exchange there. But there are other resonances that are not mean motion resonances, but secular ones, which are inherently destructive. It's you know the fingers in the asteroid belt that you see where there's just no objects. Well, those fingers run through a terrestrial region and completely deplete it. They're, they're completely catastrophic. And so if this sort of explosion didn't happen, well, the Earth, Mars, Venus, none of that would happen. None, none of that would exist, and Mercury would probably have been eaten by the sun. Um, when you say so, none of it would exist, then they are, I mean, this all happened before the Earth formed? Oh, no, 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 no. If this happened, this is the problem, right? If it, there's the chance that you could form the Earth after this jump, but you need all of the material in planetesimal for this explosion to happen, but you need the explosion to happen to get Neptune where it is and produce the Kuiper belt. And so the sequence of events is basically everything formed uh, into macroscopic bodies, Earth and Jupiter and stuff, and then everything went nuts. And it just so happens to be that the residual is what, where we're currently living. Um, so this is the this is the framework. This is the reason why I studied the Kuiper belt. So was the Earth in a different orbit before this? No, chances are the Earth didn't move very much in in this version, so this is, this is the same version. Um, so I, I give this credit to uh, David Nesvorny. By the way, if uh, Planet Nine exists, we should call it Nesvorny's planet, and here's why. Um, in this version, so there's a few, few details about the explosion that have changed, um, and basically those two previous ideas have merged together. Um, so here is Neptune. No, it's, it's the outermost planet. It's not swapping or doing anything crazy anymore. Um, and it has this phase of smooth, outward surprisingly, accent, or, um, surprisingly exponential migration. You can basically just write down a, um, a force that pro provides exponential migration and get re reproduces simulations very well. Um, and then a smaller version of that explosive dynamical instability occurs. And so you can see now Neptune becomes eccentric for a while. That eccentric Neptune also slowly migrates outwards afterwards, interacting with the disk, putting it where it is populating the Kuiper belt that we currently see today. Um, and it turns out the dynamical instability is because of planet five, or planet nine, depending on if you believe that actually exists. I'm not going to comment on that today. Um, but you can see, here it is. It crosses one of the mean motion resonances within, in this particular version, uh, Saturn, and it goes bye-bye. Um, and then you're left with the, the remaining four. Now, you don't need planet five or planet nine or the extra gas giant to, to, to do this. It just happens to be that the nicest versions, the easiest 
outcomes are the ones that include the fifth gas giant planet. Um, now, he's not the first, not even close, to say that maybe there's a hint of something like that out there, but he's the one that actually figured out how you could get it out there without realizing that that's what he was in fact doing. Um, but this is the sort of framework, um, Nice Model 2.0 or whatever, uh, that I think about when, when we're talking about um, the Kuiper Belt. And in fact, we've got some pretty strong evidence for a lot of these phases now because of Colossus. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so I'm going to show uh, this figure. Uh, I've added axes from that animation, uh, but if, you know, if this, this slide here is going to be running through uh, just to give you some framework in, in all of the different color plots we show. Um, remember, the cold classicals are in red, the resonant ones are in blue, and the scattered disk in yellow. I'll, I'll remind you of all of that. Um, uh, just a bit of a history, though. Um, so now we're talking about the, the I'm going to talk about the dynamically excited things first, and that means the purple ones, the yellow ones, and then the centaurs here in white in the middle. Um, it became very clear uh, more than a decade ago that there are in fact two surface populations uh, of these things. You just look at the B minus R color and you get these very bimodal distributions. Uh, this was first noticed for the centaurs and then has since been confirmed for the uh, dynamically excited outer populations which feed the centaurs. Um, it's, it's certain that at least for the dynamically excited things there's, there's two populations. Mind you, we have no idea what they're made of still, but we can see that there are two populations. So that's that's an annoyance for me. That one really burns in my stomach that you can identify them, but you can't say at all what they're made of. Probably some red organic crap, not too dissimilar to what you would dig out of the earth to burn in your car, because um, these things all have very low albedos. Um, they're very red. Like this is this is centered at 1.7 and 1.2, so solar sits here. Um, uh, they're, they're red. So it's probably some kind of organic, maybe not too dissimilar to this stuff here when you get a good sunburn, but who the heck knows? Um, uh, so that's the dynamically excited ones. Cold classicals, on the other hand, are all red. Is this going to show up? Right. Oh, sorry. Um, this is another way to to look at this plot. And now what I'm plotting here is spectral slope, and it's on the y-axis because astronomers can never agree how to plot these things. And then albedo of the objects. Um, this is inferred from uh, thermal measurements. So you just look at how hot the body is and how bright body is in the optical and you can point those two at each other and figure out how big the thing must be and how shiny the thing must be under barring model assumptions. So that's why these error bars are pretty big. Um, and you can see that there's basically two classes. The black ones are the ones that you can't really classify because they're either wrong colored or their albedos are too poorly measured or whatever. But you can see the neutral clump here. These are what I call the blue things. They're not actually blue. They're slightly red, right? Blue would be negative spectral slopes in this case. And then the red surfaces. Um, there's also the dwarf planets here in green, uh, green. We aren't talking about those at all today because there's chemistry involved there that, you know, we don't understand that at all, <laughs> really. Um, and then the Haumea family members, which are these peculiar ones that basically seem to be pure water ice, um, like really they appear to be pure water ice, um, at least on the surfaces, is probably some collisional fragments of some sort. Uh, but what I'm talking, what we're going to focus on today are these ones and these ones. Um, What's interesting, the dynamically quiescent Kuiper Belt objects that we know of all fall there. Um, so where you can, you can look around in the, sol in, in the other solar system and find a bunch of red class objects, but the ones that are either on eccentric orbits or out of the plane or in the medium motion resonances, they all have low albedos sitting down on this end where the cold classicals are only found in this range here. And so this was hinting to us that in fact, Maybe there's three types of object in there. And the fact that you're only finding these really shiny red ones and only really shiny red ones in the plane and that little ring that I've been talking about means that there was some structure in the primordial disk compositionally that is now reflected in the current day. Hence, Colossus can actually exist. Um, and we'll, we'll continue on with that. Um, so the, the program itself, uh, thanks Joy for this fantastic image. Which, I've, I've used this one to death, it's my computer background because it's such a lovely picture. Um, it's actually a two telescope program now. Uh, primarily, the, the, whole, the original proposed program was to just get GRJ um, colors. That's all we're doing here is gathering colors. We're spending more time on colors than anyone would thought, have thought reasonable. <laughs> um, trying to get about 100, maybe to 120 objects, depending on how things go, depending on if we get fourth, uh, fourth year extension, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and the idea here was we chose these filters to be able to identify specifically cold classical surfaces. 
um, or at least that was that was what we were trying to do because those are the ones that are still in the plane now so those are probably the best dynamical tracers or at least so we thought um, and then um, uh, OSOS, uh, through OSOS, the, the CFHT uh, had a few spare hours uh, of time, um, and it just so happened that they were sort of trying to figure out what to do with that particular semester when we were about to start on Colossus, uh, first semester of Colossus. And so at a little workshop, uh, Brett Gladman asked, what do you want to do? Uh, and I basically just waved a big U-band flag, and the dual telescope program was born. Um, through the generosity of, of CFHT and Todd having Todd Briolis having fun, um, uh, we now are uh, observing U-band on well the majority of the targets. There's I mean some of them are too faint even for for CFHT's amazing U-band performance to get these things, but we're still trying. Um, and so U-band is now an integral part of the program, except we're not getting it on all of them in the sort of biased understood fashion. This is back to the exploratory phases of color collection. Um, and the sequence here is really quite funny. Uh, the, the sequence goes, hey, CFHT, we're gonna be on the target in an hour. And they're like, hey, great, cool. And then they get an R band image and then X number of U where X is somewhere between five and 15. Um, and then an R band at the end, just in case uh, Colossus fails to get R or something like that, which of course does happen in a few cases. Um, and so this is fantastic. I am a, we, we are very, very lucky to be able to do this. Um, I know CFHC has been having some fun with it. I get to prank call them out once in a while from the dome. It's, it's quite fun. Um, and then just to be, uh, well, lucky. Um, the, the first semester, we had seven nights of IQ20 seeing. Uh, I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. But during that time, uh, JJ Cavillars was observing for New Horizons at Subaru but the New Horizons field, looking for the second flyby target, um, was only available for one half of the night. So he's like, hey, Les, what do you want to do? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's, let's you know, we're, of course, we stared at Colossus targets for the first half of each night. And so we had actually all three of these telescopes going for those, for five of those seven nights, um, or at least half, first half of those five nights. And we got RIZ there. And it was basically just like, you know, I don't know, this is a gluttony that I just don't know what to do with. Uh, so let's just gather bands that um, uh, we aren't gathering with, with the other two telescopes, uh, which turned out to be extremely fortuitous. We've been very lucky here, not just in the weather, but in, in what these results have actually found. Um, and so here is the color, 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 uh, phase curve color plot that we've, we've been able to produce with Colossus so far. Um, it's not all of it. The 2016A data have not been included in here, so there's another 10 or so targets to include. Um, importantly, the cold classicals, which are all, all has, have always been the focus of us, are in red, everything else dynamically excited in black. Um, so this is the CFHT plot. Um, we're very, very behind the ball in terms of reducing the U-band stuff. It's been challenging, but we're finally getting into doing a bunch on the plane over. Um, but this is, this is Gemini. This is Gemini and Subaru, this is CFHT, and then this is finally using OSIS because we realize that they've got, you know, 50, for every one of our targets, they've got 50 or so good R-band images. And from that, you can infer how um, faint an object, or how, how, uh, how much dimming occurs for an object as you get away from solar opposition. So the further over an angle you go. Um, and it's fantastic how much information we have here. Um, one of the first things you do notice is the, the, especially in this plot here, the bimodality that exists. I think this is the easiest way to see it. You can see that the dynamically excited things basically fall into two clumps. Of course, this red clump spreads out over to um, G minus R of ultra red, like really, really, really red. You know, like oil is red, these are redder. Um, so that, that's pretty interesting that we're finding some very strange compositionally, uh, strange things. But um, there's a lot of structure in this plot and I'm gonna talk about a, a little bit of it here. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to go backwards in terms of uh, findings, talking about the most recent things down to the ones that have already been accepted for publication. Um, this is something that uh, I would say Meg and Mikhail together have been working on, uh, but it sort of slapped me in the face last week, just what is actually showing up here. Um, so Meg is writing the, the sort of summary um, or first semester paper thing, the one that contains all of the gory details and probably the hardest paper to write. Uh, thank you, Meg. Um, and in that, we're talking about the blue-red fraction, basically, of just you know, how many blue-red things we see on the sky and then infer from that a mass. Remember, the red things have uh, much higher albedos, so when you consider albedo and size distribution considerations together, it's actually about a factor of 10, that more blue things, the 
than red things exist in the Kuiper belt compared to what you observe. Uh, what we observed is um, somewhere in the uh, seven to three to five to five blue to red ratio, depending on which semester and which, which population you actually look at. And so this is just the, the plot of this. Um, so the hot classicals, which are, are the non-resonant, not too eccentric things that have a basically 50-50 blue to red population. The resonant objects, um, it's a similar number. The scattering disk, however, uh, it's only two sigma. The fact that we only have one object in, in the red class, um, it's only, you know, there's eight on the left, there's one on the right. Only, only two sigma. So this on its own would not be enough for me to get excited. However, a number of people, including myself, have noted for a number of years now that all of the centaurs, which are objects that have fallen in from the scattered belt, seem to be lacking red objects. Um, and so I would actually say that, you know, when you take the rest of the literature in, in, in hand, this is significantly stronger than two sigma. The scattering disk only has, basically only has blue objects in it. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm starting with this is because I have no idea. Uh, we're still trying to figure it out. You know, the, as I said at the beginning, the belief was that the hot, dynamically excited things were feeding the scattering disk, and then those things were feeding the centaurs. But if that were true, this 50-50 thing, this 50-50 ratio of the populations we see that are supposedly feeding the scattering disk must be 50-50 here as well. Um, and so that's clearly not the case. Uh, I think it probably means that the scattering disk or the detached population has a, um, a residual population from the original scattering that just was predominantly blue, but this is still very, very early days on this. So, so you know, uh, take of that what you will. Wes, is that removing the Haumea family? Uh, we only have one Haumea family object in, in the hot classicals and none in the uh, scattered. So, uh, good question though, because those are predominantly blue as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so now here's this, this lucky Subaru thing. Um, so this is a this is a paper that uh, Rosemary Pike submitted oh, ten days ago now I guess um, it's it's submitted to AJ uh, and all I'm plotting here is G minus R sorry that you can't see the labels here very well G minus R versus R minus Z there's a histogram on the bottom I wouldn't worry about that too much um, what you want to take away from this is red is the cold classicals and all of the other populations here other than, so red and and the two blue ones uh, are or cold classicals, and then everything, or purple ones, excuse me, and everything else is dynamically excited. Um, I'll, I'll explain the lines in another plot in a little bit, but uh, the really interesting thing is the red cold classicals, uh, when you plot R minus Z versus G minus R, are very, very, very different than all of the others, right? They sit over here. And in fact, they sit in the band basically like this, um, which means they really are different surfaces. It's not just that they're slightly shinier than the others. They have a completely different um, a set of colors to them. It just happens to be that in G minus R, they're similar to the red uh, dynamically excited things, but in, in R minus Z, they're simply, they're basically solar colored, right? And so if you look at the spectra, which I'll, I'll show in a little bit, you can see how different these things actually are, which is fantastic because now we don't need this ultra expensive uh, J band in at, at Gemini to go and map these things out in, in the solar system. We actually only need G, R, Z. And that's, of course, this is what I would have applied for. Uh, three years ago had I known that this was actually real. Um, but we're, we're now working on it um, to, towards the, using this in the future to really, you know, basically it's, it's almost free in comparison, right? We spend 80% of our observing time on J-band. So this is a great little breakthrough uh, in, in being able to map all of these things out. Um, so this is fantastic. I'm really excited about this. Um, the next thing, uh, is this is this is Meg's um, uh, or the, basically the main science result of uh, Meg's paper is the blue to red fraction. Um, so we we think that it's basically a 60-40, maybe similar to a 50-50 uh, left to right side on this plot. Um, but the, that means from from albedo and size distribution considerations. Remember, I was talking about how much easier it is to observe a red one just because of how shiny they are. Intrinsically speaking, it's probably a 12 to one, which means the primordial disk was actually predominantly neutral material, which is not something anyone has ever said before. And this was one of the ideas about Colossus was to, once you've got your favorite dynamical picture and the actual populations at the end, then you can say some intelligent information about what the uh, compositional structure of the primordial disk was. You know, what, at what distance would you separate a neutral class object origin from a red 
class uh, origin. Right? And so this is what we're trying to do. Uh, this is still very early days here because there's some work to, to basically work forward from the dynamics or work backward from the dynamics to uh, the, the primordial disk. A little bit of that will come out in the next paper and I'm sure a lot of that in the future. Uh, but this is really cool because we, you know, we're, we're unbiased here, or at least <laughs> we're biased understood here. So we can do, we can actually do this job correctly. Yeah. And, and going from the observed to the intrinsic fraction, does that make any assumptions about the size distribution? Yes, we have a measured size distribution though, so we can actually do that pretty well. And how, or, how, how do the size distributions? Basically, <laughs> everything in life is a power law, man. Uh, so it's, it's <laughs> true about the Kuiper belt as well. The, uh, and the when size you, distributions of the blues and the reds are the same. Yeah, or? in fact, that that was one of the, the, the one of the things that we were hoping to do with Colossus. But uh, in fact, Mike Brown got to it first um, with uh, GI G minus I measurements from from Hyper -Su Prime Super Duper Mega Cam. Um, it they're they're indistinguishable, uh, which is amazing. I was actually really surprised about that, um, to be honest. But it's just basically a steep power law. And so when you consider the albedos, uh, you, you're basically observing a factor of 50% smaller object in red than blue, at least at your, your limiting depth. Um, and then when you consider the size distributions together, that means somewhere between a factor of six and 10 uh, in intrinsic population compared to what you actually observe. And so that's where these numbers come from. Utilities on this, barring statistics and all the rest of it. Uh, but you know, this is actually a really cool thing because we can actually measure this value now, which is something that I've been trying to do for a long, long time. Um, okay, so remember in that previous plot, I don't know if I can go back here. Yeah, so there's two cold classicals that sit on uh, the blue side, uh, which was really surprising to us because there's not supposed to be any blue cold classicals. That's the, the running theme. These things are predominantly red, uh, as you can see, from this picture here, uh, these are Gemini and CFHT, um, they're binary. You can actually resolve these things from the ground. And they're widely separated, so Earth, to, Earth for scale, which is I think kind of fun. <coughs> All at the same relative scale, so you can actually see how widely separated these things actually are. Um, when we saw that they were all red, this is sort of five or six years ago when we saw that they were all red, um, and that we saw that something like 30% of them are in resolvable binaries, resolvable from the ground binaries. <clears throat> uh, Alex Parker had a very, very strong insight to say these things are fragile. And so it came to Gemini, got a bunch of high seeing, you know, TOO uh, interrupts to map out the orbits of these things. And then in the second half of his thesis, threw them at Neptune in, in dynamic simulations in that sort of Nice model explosion. And he very, very handily showed that these things do not survive close passages with energy gas giant, unsurprisingly, because they're extremely dynamically fragile. Um, and so taking that all together, basically said that the cold classicals are the only Kuiper belt objects that are formed in situ. This is why they have different surfaces. Their binary mean, binarity means that they, they haven't uh, been disrupted or moved around very hard. Um, and everyone thought, okay, great, let's, let's put this one to bed. Um, except that all four or three of the four of these um, are blue, <laughs> which is weird because they're all supposedly formed where we see them and they're all supposedly formed by the same amount of stuff. That's why they're all predominantly red. And so when we saw this, it was really when we noticed this in 2015A, um, one, <clears throat> one observation from Gemini just decided to actually do some colors that night. Never do that at a telescope, by the way. But anyway, um, when we saw that these things were blue, we, the first thing we were trying to figure out is how the heck do you change the color of a surface? Stochastically, mind you, because we have a bunch of binaries that are red and, and only a handful of them that are blue. So maybe they all started blue and you, most of them have gone red through some solar process, um, but then you're arguing about really, really fine-tuned time scales and somehow preserving these five blue ones, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe these blue ones have undergone some kind of collision process, which has dredged up fresh material that hasn't been solar irradiated and gone red or made of a different composition. Maybe it's pure water ice, who knows? And you recoat the surface. We see this in the asteroid belt and on, on the, you know, like the Jovian satellites, for instance. So it's not an implausible idea. And so I spent a year staring at, you know, maybe cometary processes, for instance, might do this. Why only these five? That always was an outstanding question, but we looked at this. And it doesn't matter how you transfer material from one object to the other, whether it's through collision or cometary process or aliens standing on the surface shoveling, it doesn't matter. 
the majority of it will fall if if it remains bound to the system the majority of it will still fall back on to the object from which it came which means to preserve the equal colors that we know all of these binaries have when they're blue they're blue when they're red they're red the colors are one to one um, you have to you have to get them both equally which means if it's a collision that's happening on one there's a simultaneous collision happening on the other which is not stochastic right that's 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 tuned lies there's no way that you can take a stochastic process and produce equally colored uh, co uh, binaries for only a handful of the objects. Either the entire Kuiper belt, cold classical Kuiper belt goes blue or goes red and none the two shall meet, uh, which gave me a lot of heartburn for a while because we had no solution for this. Um, but then I got back thinking about um, the sort of Nice model 2.0 where Neptune migrated smoothly for a little bit, jumped and then migrated smoothly for a little bit more. That's not what Alex Parker looked at. He looked at the explosive um, process. And so uh, we got thinking about that. Um, oh yeah, so this is the other thing that I should point out, um, just an interesting plot. Um, so this is the cumulative color fraction, again, in spectral slope space. Uh, I, I don't know if I define this earlier. This is basically percent increase in reddening uh, for every 100 nanometers. Um, so it's just to basically assume a linear spectrum, which they basically are, um, and this gives you redness. Um, so this is the known colors I trust sample, not just Colossus, but like basically everything that I could dig out of the literature that was values that were taken quickly, so rotation doesn't screw you up, uh, and so on and so forth. Dotted line are binaries, uh, solid line are the singles, so you can see that in fact the, the singles have very different color distribution. It's only the binaries that, that stand out here, and it's only the binaries that are blue, uh, as shown by this line showing the blue class on the left. What's really cool is that it, they're also only all wide. So the red ones, the, the ones discovered with the Colossus program are here. We don't have orbits for them. Uh, so I can't tell you what their sent binary send major axis is, but I can give you lower limits on basically assuming an eccentricity of one uh, and what we currently observe them on the sky. And you can see that the, the, the send major axes of these things are at least 5,000 kilometers, um, where we find a whole bunch with HST that are red at 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers. Basically, they're resolvable limit. And there's no reason to not think that there aren't a bunch down here where we just can't resolve them yet. And so the binary properties are completely different as well, which got us thinking maybe, you know, collisions aren't the way to look at this because they're intrinsically different in basically every way that we can look at them. And so um, just going back to this a sec, these wide, this wideness, wide part is something that we need to consider. Um, so here's where I got crazy. I'm an observer and I decided to do some dynamics. I probably could have published this paper six months earlier if I didn't. But yeah, it was fun. Um, and talk about brute force. Um, normally, we have integrators that are very good at saying you're orbiting the sun with small perturbations from massive things in the system, and those integrations work extremely quickly now. They're very efficient. But these things are actually orbiting each other first and then orbiting the sun because they're binary. And so uh, I had to take the simplest uh, integration possible. Basically, it's just a leapfrog, which is a low order in Gakuda an integrator and half a day time step for 50 million years. Uh, numerically amazing that it actually computers remain stable during this time. And so just before we run here, here is eccentricity, inclination, and center major axis. That's the primordial Neptune uh, before it has undergone any kind of migration. These are all binaries. This is the range that I chose as a, just sort of a gut feeling as to maybe I can get these things to move out. Um, this dotted box here is where the cold classicals currently reside. So basically that's the goal that we're trying to put soccer balls through there. Um, and anytime you see a dot on a dot, it's, it's a binary. And so these dots will dance around because of course they're orbiting themselves. Um, when they become triangles, uh, they become unbound. So you can immediately see that, you know, mutual interactions between binaries do destroy a few of these things. You get these beautiful secular waves going on, everything seems nice and fine, um, but Neptune is being forced to move outwards here. This is a fictitious force, we, we, you know, because it's too hard to do this and the proper simulations all at once. Um, and you can see when objects basically get close to Neptune, they immediately become unbound. This is why the majority of triangles down here. So Neptune is now moving to about 26 AU where bedlam starts to occur. Um, but the key point here is, remember, we started uh, objects inside of 40 AU, and the two to one mean motion resonance has now moved outside that and dragged a bunch of objects with it, basically like a snowplow. Um, and so you can see objects are trapped in this mean motion resonance. Now the solar system is blowing up, 
But the key point is binaries are surviving, right? In this box, they basically survive perfectly fine. When they become colored, they actually fall into their cold classes, right? And it's about 30 to 40 million years is when that jump occurred, uh, the dynamical instability of the gas giants, which halts this process. The smooth outward migration no longer uh, is valid in this particular case. And so at, at 39 is when they, they, they reach the appropriate distance for that jump in this particular iteration. When that jump occurs, objects that are inside this box, which are all the colored points, are the ones that remain as cold classes. They're basically dynamically isolated from everything else at that point, and they will sit there for the age of the solar system as binary or single. Um, now you can see that there's a few objects in here that are in fact uh, singles. So the distribution that I chose originally was obviously not perfect, but you can still see that the majority of these things are in fact binaries. So that immediately led us to say, aha, here's the out that we need. You start from a population that is inwards of the red things. You still say, okay, the red things have formed where we see them, but the blue things started maybe five, six, seven AU inwards. And because of that temperature difference or compositional difference, we don't yet know they're blue. They're also all binary, which that's, that's crazy, right? That's really crazy. Uh, but then Neptune moved out, just did its normal thing in the framework that we've believed for a while now. And the result is that you actually push a few of these blue things out and destroying the binaries where you actually need to destroy them so that the blue things you see in the dynamically excited populations aren't binary, right? One of the other key constraints from our observations. Um, so we're still trying to sort this out. I mean, big questions like, why is the transition uh, between the blue things and the red things, only a few AU, only a handful of AU inside of where the red things currently exist. That's kind of fluky to me. That, that one doesn't sit so well on my shoulders. But, you know, we don't actually understand the chemistry that makes something go red, so maybe that's perfectly fine. Another question we have, um, binaries. That's not how things form, right? Like it's, it's dust collecting on a windshield and just a macroscopic body running through a a solar system collecting bugs, growing slowly as a single thing, right? This has been the framework for years. And so why is it that, like, if, if this story is true, it means that everything that formed inside of 39 AU that was interacting with the mean motion resonances started as a binary before that migration existed, right? That's what this means, because once they're there, there's no mass left. You can't take two singles and interact to produce binaries afterwards. It all had to happen before. And so there's a phase of planetesimal formation that we don't yet understand. It could be that these things all form through um, this new idea of uh, turbulence clumping solid material together, turbulence goes away, you're gravitationally bound, and then basically a, a fragmenting disk of star forming disk will produce binary stars. Same thing might happen for the planetesimals. Or it could be that there's just a huge swarm of pebbles floating around when you get two single objects that have actually formed as singles that get near each other, um, that the, the dynamical friction from the pebble cloud will strip angular momentum and harden these two things into a binary. Both of those are legitimate. Um, so when I say formed as binary, I use the term formed very loosely, I actually mean they were binary before Neptune came along. I'm just lazy with my words. Um, but we don't, we, we don't yet know which of those two stories, if either of them is actually true. But we do know that before this migration occurred, they all had to be binary maybe 80% only, but you know, certainly higher than 50, and maybe as much as 100, which is, that was not what we were going for with Colossus, but a pretty fantastic result as far as I'm concerned. So we, we got this one published in Nature Astronomy about two months ago, um, uh, and I still don't know what the hell it really means. Um, all right, so this is the, the, new, the new picture. Um, if, this, if the push-out story is true, it means that smooth migration had to happen. And it had to happen before the jump to isolate these things in the cold classical region. So David Nesmorny's idea of smooth jump smooth has basically been validated. Uh, at least that's, that's how I'm interpreting this. Colossus is actually working, right? We're learning now about the migration scenarios. It can't be too slow because otherwise the binaries will have too high an eccentricity and never be populated into the cold classical region. It can't be too fast because the binaries get disrupted. There's a, a Goldilocks zone here. How wide that Goldilocks zone is, I don't yet know because you know these, these simulations take months to run um, in this really awful brute force method. Um, so we haven't probed the range that I would like to probe yet, uh, but I know that these binaries are the key to really starting to unlock that. Moreover, they came from a region that is completely absent of objects now. 
So we have these fantastic ultra sensitive dynamical probes of a region that we wouldn't be able to infer anything about otherwise. So that's early days on, on that one, but you know, we're gonna learn about planetesimal formation in that region plus chemistry and all this sort of thing. We do know that the migration was at least five AU um, uh, for, for these objects, uh, but that's basically the only thing I've been able to measure so far because I'm not good yet with the dynamics. Um, so that, that's fantastic. And then again, uh, I'll emphasize this point that they all are binaries, which is the, the weird part. But this picture here, like, David, David done well. This is, this is pretty close to true. Um, how big this jump is, we don't know. We know that it has to have been at least a small, small enough or big enough jump that the two to one mean motion resonance leaves the cold classical regions. So it doesn't destroy the, the cold classicals, but we don't know how big. It could have actually been like a three AU jump. That actually would work perfectly fine in this scenario. Um, so we're working on the late stage dynamics now with these binaries to try and nail down this part here that one might not come from Colossus, but we didn't have any real handle on this before, uh, at least from a, a composition's perspective, and, and now we do. So that's, I think, the, the main result of, of Colossus so far. Um, so uh, this is the disk that I've been talking about, and I say the new disk, I should have actually wrote primordial up there. Um, remember how I said the cold classicals have a different R minus Z color, so they're a different the composition, the red cold classicals are compositionally different. Oop, whoops. Ah, this can work. There. Now we'll give that a sec. Aha, good. Okay. So we still do believe the red cold classicals form basically in situ. That story is too good to not be true, unless we don't understand anything at all about the solar system's formation. So the red ones form in situ. It's nice that they actually do have solidly different surfaces <coughs> um, so that that all hangs together um, i don't know if you noticed from the plots but in in basically every color that we can measure the blue binaries have the same colors as the the blue dynamically excited things so primordially our best guess is that they actually originated from the same population and the only difference between the blue binaries and the blue dynamically excited singles is the dynamics that move them to where we currently see them. So the ones that are in the scattered disk or the hot classicals or in the resonances, those are ones that basically got unlucky and saw Neptune, where the few blue binaries, you know, the 1% the um, that have been pushed out. And so that's this population here. But then we have these dynamically excited red things, which are found basically everywhere in the Kuiper belt that are all singles, but of a different composition. And so you can't take those from the cold classicals without destroying the classical belt. The only obvious inference is that they came from the region inside of that. It's still very, very early days as to where these things are, but not as early as we were a few years ago because of Meg's, you know, Meg's paper that we're writing now. This is the most dominant population of all of them, right? There's a factor of 10 more mass in the current carbon belt from this population than this population. And so I don't, I don't think the, the annuli that are drawn here are, are too dishonest. Um, and, but that's the current picture. We haven't got anything truly quantitative from this yet. We're still working on that. Um, okay, so now we're gonna look to the future a little bit. <clears throat> um, the the cold classicals have actually been very insightful for us. Uh, what, I, what I've shown here is the, this is a, a spectrum I took of a checklist. I've got a PhD student working on uh, compositions of Kuiper belt objects with uh, X shooter on VLT. Um, generally speaking, it's a very frustrating game because there's absolutely nothing to look at. This is a very typical spectrum. Um, my, my bet in 2014 when I started this program was, okay, we're just going to go, you know, signal to noise factor five or 10 better than anyone has ever done before. We're finally going to start to see the features, right? Finally. No, there's nothing. There's not even, you can't, there's no water, like the, the, water that's everywhere and there's no water on this bloody object. It's just a boring spectrum. It's linear through here, it's linear through there and there's some transition. We've known this for years. That's what most Kuiper belt object spectra look like. And there's no hint that we can use to identify any materials at all. And this even happened to New Horizons when they went past Pluto. They saw the red stuff on the surface. They said it's probably organic. There's, the, you know, there's a few simple organics that have been identified in other places. So this red stuff is a natural consequence of the chemistry we believe. That's the bloody spectrum of it. And it's totally infuriating because we can't tell anything from this. 
Right? We believe that that red slope is probably due to an organic feature with the center of it sitting here at something like 0.3 microns, where of course we can't observe with any telescope anywhere. Uh, so that's not useful. And there's supposed to be, I was looking for um, pH features in through here, which as you can see, there is absolutely none of. Any, any structure in this, by the way, is just residual from uh, the X shooter camera, which is not great when the arms overlap and stuff. It's basically nothing there. Um, but the cold classicals, which have remained uh, low priority targets for spectroscopic programs because of how small and faint they are, like, you know, 23rd, 24th magnitude faint, um, they're different. So here what I've plotted are the dynamically excited blue and red um, colors from Colossus, U, G, R, J, and Z in a couple of cases. And the, the, the bands that you see, the width of the bands, um, represents the range of colors that you see, right? So it's not a, a spectrum per se. If you want to call it an R5 spectrum, that's fine. Um, and then the cold classicals are in green. Um, previous compositional efforts to sort of provide a taxonomy um, which I don't, didn't, didn't like this work very much because they basically, all, all the taxons overlap um, are, are shown here to just say, look, we're actually getting the same range of colors that everyone else has, so good, we're not, we're not insane. But the co-classicals with their Z band measurements here, they're flat and then they get red again. Some, not all, right? You, you could actually have an object that goes red and it basically remains neutral through here. But there are a number of objects in a sample of Z band that go flat and then go red again at exactly the range that they should if they have silicates on their surfaces. Because silicates, simple rocks, like the ones you are surrounded by here, olivine, has a honking deep, you know, 50% deep absorption centered at 0.8 to 0.9 microns. And it's really, really wide. In fact, it's exactly as wide as it's supposed to be based on this. And so this, this is, this, this is the leverage we need to get eight hours for one target, because that's basically what it's going to take. Even with JWST, this, this, is, this is a hard observation to make. Um, uh, but, you know, stay tuned. We might be uh, talking to you guys for a few more uh, 